initiative with respect to any way W is, is basically going to be, um, you're going to pick up two delta functions. So the, the indices, uh, both of the, the two indices need to be the same in order for the derivative to be non-zero, uh, in which case it, will, it would just be one. And so if we, we write down the equation, this, this is actually, this is the operation we just performed. So um, we're taking the, the, the weight matrix and positioning it over four neurons at a time. And we're making that multiplicative sum for each of the outputs. And then when we shift one to the right or down, uh, we, we change the indices accordingly. Um, the, the I and the J of the, so, that, so that's us shifting to a different location in the input, input matrix. So this is the equation for the convolution. We're summing over all of the possible K and L. So in this case, we've only got, uh, so this is so this is k l zero one and two for k and then we move down to, to k equals zero l equals one so that uh, basically we've only got two values in, in this particular example but okay so we're, we're summing uh we're we're making that sum and when we take the derivative the derivative of this z with respect to the w is uh we're, we're basically going to um pick up the two delta functions here and that allows us to simplify the sum so k and n need to be the same l and m need to be the same and so in the end you get this sum which actually if you can just if you look at these the the uh indices since i plus n equals n plus i you can flip that and you can compare this final expression with the sum to the first one and it actually turns out that our gradient for the convolution to uh, to get the uh, the the derivative with respect to this parameter is just another convolution of the input with the output gradients. So that's how we're going to pass along the uh, the information and the output gradients to these particular weights, so that we can construct uh, our small displacement that we need to make to minimize the network for our convolutional layer. So this this is just more this is just kind of to show the uh the idea of what's going on in each of the layers in pytorch when you uh when you do the minimization we're not actually going to go we're, we're not actually going to, to to have to implement this today it's already been implemented um but i thought it would be interesting to see this so a couple of other things that may be important for for today when we when we do the activity are some additional uh terminology that uh, relates to convolutional neural networks. So um, the, the stride is the step size in each dimension when we do the when we do the convolution. So here we're actually we're looking at a stride of one. We're moving one in the in the x direction and one in the y direction. Uh, it's possible to use a stride of one two so the, so instead we're basically skipping this whole row we just jump down um two two values in y um you could use two two in which case you'd only have one two three four operations and you'd have a four by four output um it, oftentimes instead of instead of using a, a larger stride one can use pooling which we'll also talk about um but one other comment to one to add was padding um so the the padding is basically if you want an output matrix that is the same size your, as your input matrix, you can uh, increase the size by just adding zeros to the ends of it. This is often done because you may want to organize your network in a specific way. And, uh, and so you may want the same output dimensions as your input dimensions for a particular layer. And so in that case, you can add padding and you can, and PyTorch allows you to specify some amount of padding for a uh, convolutional layer, and so that, and you can even you can even say where to add the zeros and on the left side or the right side. In this case, we're just gonna we're just adding one column and one row of zeros, so uh, it's it's uh, it's less complex. But you can add several columns and rows to get the output size that you, that you want. Um, so pooling, which is one one thing I just mentioned. Uh, is a process by which you take neurons in some um, 
in some box, so in some uh, in some small, small subspace of your input, and replace them with either the uh, the maximum value or or potentially the average value within that region. So in this case, uh, we can we can take say we're doing a max pooling. If you, if you look at the 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 darker neurons as or the darker values as um, greater, you could see that we've taken the darkest one, the the, the most um, in the, in the left hand most box here, and we have uh, we've kept that one. And then in the in the the next, so here we've done uh, a stride of two actually. Here, we're going to take this box and move it over to the other four neurons on the right and take the maximum and then um, d do the same thing to the, the bottom two rows. And so we're left with, um, with a two by two matrix. So this is one way of reducing the dimensionality of our inputs. Uh, and we can, at the same time, increase the number of channels. So when we we when we used our weight matrix earlier to do our convolution, we can actually do that with several different weight matrices. So the the weights are the same throughout the convolution process, but we're using several different uh, several different weight matrices, um, and and so this can lead to several channels of output. So we have several feature maps for the same input. Uh, the if the input contain several channels, the weight matrices have a third dimension. So like in this case, we've got the the W11, 12, 21, and 22, but we have it repeated three different times. And so these are actually independent weights. Um, and they, uh, so yeah, this is, uh, this is the idea of multiple channels. So this is something that we could potentially apply today uh, in the activity. So are there any questions about what we just covered with uh, convolutional neural networks? And we'll we'll talk more about how to to use those in PyTorch after we go through. We're gonna I'm gonna briefly discuss what we're gonna try to do um, today in the activity. Yes, I don't know. Maybe you commented. Uh, what are the advantage of these convolutional neural networks respect to the dense networks? All right, so uh, yeah, I, I, I mentioned that a bit uh, when uh, we talked about the, the weight tying. So, um, so since uh, so since we're using the same weights for this operation, they it, these these individual kernels are in in some sense. Uh, being trained to identify specific features of of the input so you can think of well it, it doesn't always end up like this but you can think of if you're if you're uh if you're analyzing images you could think that okay we have some kernel that it's its job is to identify um a specific thing in the the image it ends up probably being more complicated than that, but you can think of this way matrix is particularly uh, suitable for for identifying uh, some feature. Let's say you're you're looking at you're classifying animals, dogs, and cats. So this 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 particular weight matrix uh, identifies some feature of the dog, like the eye, or 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 is is trained to. Um, to focus on some particular aspect of the image. It, there's so I don't really have any good examples of this, but you can look that there are people that do an analysis of what exactly the 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 weight the weights look like in their convolutional neural networks, and they do find patterns that certain weights have kind of adapted to identify certain parts of the image or have um, I, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but they uh, convolutional networks in general are more suitable for image recognition or image analysis and because of this idea that we have put restrictions on the weights uh we the network does not need to figure out that that neighboring pixels are related we're kind of making that um we're making that restriction in some sense 
we're, uh, we're, we're giving that information in some sense to the network before we're actually training it at all. So that's that's one. Um, also, the fact that we're sharing weights, the 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 weight that the number of parameters in a in convolutional networks uh, tend to be lower than the corresponding number of parameters if you were to just fully connect all of the neurons. So um, it makes the network somewhat smaller. Uh, it's likely that that the, these networks will be will possibly be easier to train on on image based input. So okay. So okay. So let's uh, let's talk for a minute about the next experiment. Next stands for a neutrino experiment with the xenon TPC. So this is our uh, our setup in Canfranc. Uh, it, it's so Canfranc is in the Pyrenees Mountains, just in the border to France. And uh, we're searching for neutrinoless double beta decay. So the uh, we hope to to commission a bigger version of the experiment, the next one hundred later this year. Uh, and so that actually, this big tank here is the the pressure vessel for next one hundred. Uh, right now, it's it's the it's the emergency recovery tank for the the the, the smaller detector that we're running. Um, which it's kind of hard to see in this picture, which is behind the uh, the the electronics racks here. Basically, we're we're looking for this neutrinoless double beta decay, which would be two electrons interacting in high pressure xenon gas, and the the, the detector is capable of measuring the energy and reconstructing particle tracks of of an interaction. So. Um, Neutrinos double beta in, in terms of energy is going to look like a small energy peak at the end of a um, a wider distribution of two neutrino double beta. So two neutrino double beta is a standard model process that is known to exist. It has been measured. Neutrinos double beta is not a standard in the model process. And if it were to exist, the neutrino is its, it would mean that the neutrino is its own antiparticle or it is Majorana. So it's it's an interesting experiment in that. There's new physics to be um, to be found if that experiment or if that uh, if the decay actually exists. Um, and so the problem that we're confronting is that even the uh, well, first of all, there's there's a lot more background than just this the, than just the two neutrino double beta. Um, but we're looking for a single energy peak, but events could still fall into that energy peak that are not neutrinoless double beta. So. We want to look at how the event appears in the detector. So, um, so this is so the neutrino double beta has two beta decays, and so each beta decay has an electron uh, as its product. Those two electrons come from a common vertex. So the signal event will look like two electrons from a common vertex, and when the electron slows down and stops, it tends to leave more energy near the end of its track. So a two electron track looks more like this, where you've got two denser regions of, uh, we call them blobs of ionization at the ends of the tracks. And a, a an event that may have the same energy, but is not double beta would look like the one on the right, where you've only got one of those uh, dense regions of, of uh, ionization. So what we want to do today is train a neural network to distinguish the, the kinds of events on the left from the kinds of events on the right. And so uh, to do that, we can use convolutional neural networks, and we're going to look at inputs that are these. These are actually electron positron pair events at a, at a somewhat different energy um, because this, this is something we can actually study experimentally reasonably. And so we're doing this to, to study our, um, our signal classification capabilities with the neural network. And we're going to look at events that are 20 by 20 by 60. And so they contain energy information and, and that that will show us a the 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 pattern of energy deposition the track and so what we're seeing here actually is a sum over the z dimension but uh in the in the activity we're going to have a 3d matrix 20 by 20 by 60 so uh we'll be looking at these uh these tensors of of shape n so the n is going to is going to be our batch size 
and then 20 by 20 by 60. So what is the, the we're going to have about 30, 35,000 uh, events per class available to do the training, validation and test. So what is the, the batch? This uh, I, I don't remember if we talked about this last week, but the, the gradient descent process, the minimization is often performed is often, often is often performed in mini batches. So this is the stochastic gradient descent. We're, we're calculating the gradient by making approximations to it with smaller subsets of the of the full data set. Um, and so in PyTorch, we're going to use they have a class for for um, defining data sets, which defines how to retrieve data um, once loaded into memory or actually it doesn't even need to be loaded all into memory. We're going to try to do that today, but um, it can be it can be loaded on the fly and uh, we they also there's also a class called data loader which essentially gives you batches of that data it shuffles up the data and pulls out batches of the size that 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 you tell it and so then the loss and the gradients can be computed with some of the some of the things we went through last week using an optimizer um calling the model uh calculating the loss calling the loss dot backwards to do the gradients and then updating the weights using the optimizer and that's all done on a batch by batch basis. So um, that so the the tensors that we're actually going to be looking at have a batch size dimension. That's that's important to know because when, when we when when we actually look at constructing the network, we need to to know that the the tensors that we're looking at have this extra um, dimension here. We're not getting them one at a time. We're getting them n at a time, and n is some size that we define. Uh, another note is on uh, dropout. So dropout is a technique that's used to um, to avoid overfitting the network to a specific training set. So basically what happens is during a training step, a, a say we've got dropout applied to this final layer, there's a probability for each of those neurons to basically disappear. All the connections are are cut. Um, all the input and output connections are cut, and then the training step is made. And so, in the next step, we may we we, we may keep both neurons, or we we may uh, we may remove the other neuron. And so, um, this helps avoid overfitting. And uh, so that that's we may want to use that today. So that's why I mentioned it. Um, so, and here's a summary. So here's, for example, the command for to use dropout on a uh, on a specific. So this is this is a dropout layer. So it can be applied to another layer of neurons. Um, so these are some of the PyTorch commands. Uh, I believe we used the linear one last week. These are the W X plus B linear layers that we've talked about, and uh, um, you just give it an input and an output number of of features, so a number of, of values. And uh, now we have other layers such as the convolutional. This is the 2D convolution. Uh, one can also use 3D convolution. So in that case, we would have um, an additional dimension. And in, in fact, with 2D convolutions, we have a channel dimension and an XY with 3D convolutions, we have a channel dimension and XYZ. So in, in, in fact, to use 3D convolutions with our current data set, we would need to stick another dimension here um, that corresponds to the channels. And if we want to use a 2D convolutional layer, then the channel dimension would actually be this one. We may want to make it Z. So we may want to, to transpose this tensor so that we've got an N by 60 by 20 by 20. That's one of the potential ways to approach this. Um, and so let's see. So these these are some commands that we may want to use today. Um, this and this one flatten we'll look at it in just a minute, but basically takes a it would take our 2D input and make it a single uh, single vector. And, and uh, the start dim is one equal to one is important. Because we want to keep the, uh, we don't want to flatten on the batch dimension. Also, uh, uh, and ReLU is another kind of uh, activation that's commonly used in in convolutional neural networks. It's it's introduces nonlinearities by basically just making a cut at zero. Uh, so this is something we may want to use today. 
Uh, so first of all, before looking at the uh, the notebook, that we're this is this is the network that we're going to work through initially. And so it is a it's a fully connected network. And when we define the network, we want to we, we have an, an init, uh, initializer method in which we define the layers we're going to use. And then we have this this function forward, which is called when we when we call the uh, we at, when we make an object of this uh, of this type and and call it as if it were a function calls the forward method. And so this shows how to apply the layers that we defined uh, in the initial or in the init method. So in this case, we're going to we're going to flatten the input. Remember, it's n by 20 by 20 by 60. We're going to flatten it, ignoring the batch dimension. So we're going to get n by 24,000. Uh, and then we're going to use a uh, two linear layers. So uh, it's just going to be a 32, uh, 32 value layer, and then a one value, a single neuron to do the. Uh, it's going to classify it as a signal, which is one or background zero. So here's here's what that network actually looks like. We do the flatten, and we get. We still have the batch dimension. We get all of the neurons in one single uh, one single column. Those connect to every neuron, this is a fully connected layer, uh, of a 32 neuron layer. Those all connect to a single neuron. The loss is then constructed from the prediction made by the last neuron. So this is our, ex our example network. It doesn't do that, it doesn't do so well. This is actually only trained on 10, 10 epochs. But uh, so I don't actually, I don't know if we talked about epochs last week. I believe we did, but basically an epoch is one pass through the entire data set. So it's split up into batches. We've and we train enough batches that we get through the entire data set. That's one epoch. This is only 10, 10 epochs. And uh, what we want to do is essentially make a better network than this. Something that gives us better signal versus background discrimination. So the network's predicting for 50% probability for a lot of the signal and a lot of background events it's uh it's not it's not predicting probabilities close to one from for the signal events nor probabilities close to zero for the background events so we want to fix that we want to move this background distribution as far to the left as possible and the signal distribution as far to the right as possible and so here's the link to the notebook so let's uh let's open that up now and uh And and go through it. So, are there any questions at this point on what we what we talked about? I hope it was helpful. Okay. Well, let's see. If not, I'm going to. That's only to say that your transparencies just are in Indico. No, if people want need to look at them, they are there. Ah, uh, right. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. So all of these, uh, all of these slides are here. Let's see, can you see this? So these are all of the links for for today. In fact, there's actually some more background information here on what we're on that kind of more detail on the the experimental side of what we discussed in the slides. Um, here's our here's the network we talked about. Um, Actually, it's not exactly the, the same code as it was on the slides. Um, but OK, so let's let's open the notebook. And go through it. Uh, and and do the classification with the example linear net. So then after that, we're going to we're going to take a short break and then we're going to come back and try to do the uh, to to create a new net. Um, you can try to work on that on your own or with other people in the course if you're in contact with them. It's much harder to do this since we're not in a classroom, uh, in, a, in a physical classroom. But uh, then we can come back and we can go through a potential solution and discuss it. So first, we're going to run the notebook. I don't know, does, does, um, is, so has everyone managed to open the notebook that 
that wants to to go through this uh, that wants to go through the notebook. Are there any problems opening it? It's just it's similar to last week. Okay. It's not if not what we one of the first things we want to do is go to maybe, change run type. Maybe you Sorry? can put it in the chat, uh, Josh. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's on the last slide there, but let's see. I'll I'll put the link in the chat also. All right. So okay, so one of the first things we want to do is uh, let me let me start over on, on that. Change runtime type. So we want to go to GPU. We want to use the GPU uh, to do the training. And so we're going to start with that. Um, anyway, and so these are just the import statements for the uh, the libraries we want to use. It's actually taking a while to do this. Okay, so here we're going to enable the use of CUDA, which is the the library behind all of the GPU operations, and so. Um, first of all, it's, it, we're, we're checking to see if that if that library is actually available on this machine. It should be since we since we enabled it with change runtime type to GPU. Uh, and then there's the, also a flag here. If you want to to disable CUDA just to see how how much slower it trains without CUDA, you can do that. We're going to leave it true for now. So it's going to uh, okay. So it's available and enabled. So now we're going to download the data set. So these. These are just two files sitting in Dropbox that contain all of the, the 35, approximately 35,000 events of background and signal. So it's downloading those. Maybe, maybe just can you indicate again how you run in the GPU? What do you have to do here in the, in the notebook to run in the GPU? Okay. So you go to runtime, change runtime type, and then select GPU. Okay, thank you. Okay, so all right. So then once you've got that and you've run these first cells down the data. Okay, so these these variables here, we probably don't want to change, it's just defining. Um, so what later we have references to the the dimensions of the, the data set. And then it's going to make a, a an individual folder to save the models in during the training. Since this is kind of since we're kind of working on a a node that's somewhere on on Google's cloud, we're not really so worried about the the directory structure, but we're still going to organize it somewhat. And may, the the two files are downloaded directly to whatever the top level directory of this notebook is. But we're going to make another subdirectory for models. Um, this this uh, particular cell isn't that it, it's important, but we don't probably don't need to change anything. Uh, so now here we can we've got the data files. We can open them and look at individual events. So we're looking at some background events, and we can change this number and see various different events. So that's there's another one. That one that one looks more background like. So. That one looks quite like it's got quite a bit of ionization density throughout the whole track. Or it, it looks like a more uniform ionization density. Um, so, okay, and we can also look at signal. So let's look at signal event number five. That's not, that doesn't give us a whole lot of information because now we're looking in the Z direction. We can or we're summing in the Z direction. We can sum over X and get the YZ projection. Okay, so here you can kind of see two, two blobs at the ends of the track in the, the YZ projection. So anyway, this, these are the events that we're going to be passing to the network. Again, that's not a very good view of that one. Um, but okay. So 
Next, we're going to define the functions for the, the data set preparation. So these, again, to, these, these are not functions we're going to focus on too much today because the main point of the activity is to make a better neural network. And so that we'll get to in a minute. But um, just so that if, for, if you want to use these kinds of things in the future, um, or maybe you have already, this is uh, an extension of the PyTorch data set class, which allows you to define your own class for um, for providing data in the in the batching process. So um, here, for example, we're just extracting the events from from an HDF5 file, and um, we are taking a specific range of those of those events and um, and we're we're loading them all we could load them all into memory at once or we could load them kind of on the fly right now we're going to try to load them into in all into memory since since Google gives us this nice machine with about almost 13 gigs of of RAM we should be able to get all of the events into memory at once uh, I have had one problem where it, it gave it gave me some issue of of about RAM, and so if it does that, you could probably just restart the notebook and try again. Uh, that that shouldn't happen though. Um, but okay, so th this this length function basically tells you the how many uh, events in total are in your data set, and uh, the uh, the get item tells you. Um, or it tells you how to get a specific uh, a specific event at, at some index. So actually, if, so if we have them all loaded into memory, for example, uh, it's just picking that that event off of the the array that we have them them all stored in. And it also gets the label so that the correct answer zero for background and one for signal. Uh, so that's that's our data set class. We'll run the cell. And we'll also run the next cell, which is an example of how to construct a data set. It's, going, it's only got 10 events. And so here we're taking the label and the event. And so this one is zero, so it's a background. Here's a signal. Maybe if we look at it in YZ, it will be a bit more apparent that it's a signal. Yeah, well. Okay, it does look it does look somewhat single, signal like. There's very there are denser areas of ionization at the ends. Okay, so here's another signal. Okay, so now we're going to create the neural network. So this is the network we just looked at on the, the slides, the fully connected network. Um and so here you could it gives you a bit of a summary. So once it loads, we'll be able to see, okay, we've got one linear layer of 32 neurons and then another one of one neuron. It also tells you the total number of trainable parameters. And since, since this is a fully connected layer, there's going to be a lot of parameters. There's a, there's a weight for every single one of those 24,000 inputs. And so times 32. And then another, um, another weight for... And, and a bias and a single bias for each of these neurons. Then another weight for each of the 32 inputs and a bias. So that's the 33 parameters here. And then I'm not sure if that all adds up correctly to 768,032, um, but it most likely does. The 24,000 times 32 plus 32. So um, okay. So now we're going to train the network. This is our, our training function. So it's similar to the stuff that we did last week. We're, we're getting things in batches. We're, we're uh, setting zero grad on the optimizer. Remember, that's important so that it doesn't keep summing the gradients. We're running the forward pass of the model, constructing the loss, which right now is called criterion, but we'll, we'll, we'll see later what we actually use as the loss. Backward to do the gradients, updating the, the weights and biases. No, well, all of the parameters. Here's some some extra code to compute accuracy so that, so that we can see how we're doing later. Um, and then we also have a similar function to evaluate the validation set. So we, we're splitting up into training, validation, and then later a test set. 
Um, the validation step just computes the uh, result and loss and the accuracy, and that's it. We don't actually have to do any gradients for the validation step because we're just interested in knowing what the uh, what the performance is. So let's run that cell also. And so now here we go. We're going to set up two data sets, the training set with 25,000 of the 35,000 events, and then the validation set with five the next 5,000 events. Now we're going to run the training. So we're going to run over 10, 10 times over the data set, 10 epochs. And uh, there's, there's some code here to make, to make some plots that we'll see in a minute. We're going to create this. So this is where we actually create our, our network. So when, when you make the new network, you can just you can go up and make a new cell and define a new class with a, with a different network, and then you'll need to, to call that here. Here's our loss, binary cross entropy. So I believe we looked at this type of loss last week. Uh, we're, we're basically assuming just two classes. So here it is. And uh, this with logits means that it's going to apply the activation itself. So we're not going to apply a sigmoid activation to our final layer. And actually, if you look in the, the network, we don't. So, so here we've got, um, we're, we're doing the, the flatten, and then we've got the first la layer. Then we apply an activation of a, sig a sigmoid. Then we apply the second layer, and we don't apply an activation. So the loss is actually going to do that. The loss function will do that for us. Then when we do the, uh, when we do the evaluation, Let's see. When we actually do the, the test evaluation later, we're going to need to call a sigmoid to get the correct output because we're, we're not doing that in the network itself. So that's something we have to keep track of. We'll use an atom optimizer, which is something we, we looked at last week. Um, the, these CUDA statements are basically telling PyTorch that we need to load the, uh, the data onto the GPU. So um, that those are only used if we're using CUDA. And since we are, we're, we're going to call them. Uh, we, we can notice that um, that, is, that is also being called for the, uh, where is it? Yeah, for the actual data itself, it's being loaded onto the, the GPU before running it through the model here. So, okay. Then uh, let's see, where were we? So here we're going to load a, a model from file if we've chosen to. So here you can choose whether you want to load another model. Right now we, we, don't, we don't have any models trained, so we're going to say false. And we're going we're gonna to say true to training, so we want to train a new one. Um, so the during the actual training, we're going to go through the epochs and call the train function that we defined above. Uh, we get the loss and accuracy. Well, so actually, this this particular function is not the train function we defined above. This one is. This model dot train is preparing the the model to be trained. So it's uh, it's it, calling this enables certain things like dropout, which we're not using in this example, but we may want to use later on. Uh, it's it's as opposed to model dot eval, which turns off things like drop uh, drop out. And uh, so during the training, you want these you want drop out, for example, to actually take effect. During the evaluation, you don't. And so this is setting this is basically setting the model into a state in which it's ready to be trained. Uh, we do the the training. Here, we're just gathering the information about the losses and accuracies so we can plot them. Then we, we turn off the, 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 the gradient operations to do the evaluation of the model in the, on the validation set. And then uh, we also gather that information. 
and then we we can save each each uh, the model after each epoch of training. If you don't want to do that, you can just comment this line. It's it, it probably won't make a difference unless you're saving so many model model weights or model files that you run out of space. Um, and then this is just code to make the plots that we're about to see during the training. So let's run. So here it's going through several batches to get through the entire epoch. So we're done with one, and it's going to show us what our loss is and accuracy for that epoch. The, the black dot is the training, and the red dot is the validation set. So we, we want both of them to go down. We're trying to minimize the loss. It looks like the training set's doing slightly better than the, the validation set, which makes sense because those are the events the network's actually looking at. Um, and so looks like, let's see. So we got through five. So we're halfway down with our 10 epoch training. So here we see that validation sets starting to slowly get left behind. Training set is doing slightly better. So we're, we're overfitting essentially. Um, with some, some dropout, maybe that could be helped. There are other techniques also, regularization to avoid overfitting, but um, also convolutional net networks are, are probably more likely to, not necessarily though, uh, to be trained without so much overfitting. Okay, so we're just going to stop there just to, to show this example. Uh, this is now we're creating the test set, 5,000 events. And so we're going to take the signal and background events from the test set. And, uh, and run them through the network. So remember, we need to make the sigmoid because we didn't do it before uh, in the actual definition of the network. Uh, and so we're going to do, we're going to run the model and the sigmoid, and that will give us the prediction. And so we're going to plot all of those predictions. So it's the same plot we, we just saw on the slides. And this gives you a curve of the signal efficiency versus the background rejection. So um, basically, this is looking at the, the correct, the number of correct signal events and the number of correctly predicted background events. And so the signal efficiency is the correct, the correctly predicted number divided by the total number, and the, the background rejection is the correctly rejected, correctly predicted background divided by the total number. And so when we plot one versus the other, ideally we will get, uh, in, in the ideal, ideal case, this will, we will always reject all backgrounds. So this would be a straight line, and we will always accept all signal. So this, this would always be at, at one. Um, so we would get a point um, in, the, in the upper right hand corner. Um, so in the absolute random case, we would just get a straight line down the middle as if this were just a, a coin flip. And so the, the network's actually doing something. It's causing this curve to billow out a bit move, and move closer to the upper right hand corner. But we want to get a curve that is much closer, that has a, uh, that, that's much closer to this upper right-hand corner. So we want to make a network that improves this. Um, okay, so at this point, I would say that we take a 15-minute break and then we'll come back. And the, the idea will be mostly to focus on this part of the code here and create a new network class, I don't know, uh, maybe you want it to be a, a convolutional network. We can name it whatever you want. Um, extend module and write a new network and see or use it in the training and see how it does. See if it, if these this plot looks better. For example, if the loss gets gets lower and the validation loss is closer to the training loss, if the accuracy gets higher. Later, if this hist if this histogram separates signal and background more. 
and this curve gets closer to the, the upper right hand corner. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions at this point, but what we'll do is come back at maybe 1020 and then uh, actually people can stay on the, the class, on the interactive class. And, uh, and basically if anyone has any questions, I'll be here. Um, I don't know if, if Jose Anka will, will, will stay here. Um, Gonzalo is also here, I believe. And so if anyone has questions, you can just ask them. Um, we can maybe work for like a half hour and see where everybody's at. And then if if anyone has, I don't know if, if, I can, if we can allow someone else to share, but afterwards someone can possibly share their solution. Um, and we can show you a, a potential convolutional solution. And then we'll we'll talk about it and see if there's any questions and then that will be it for, for the day. So if there's no other questions right now, we'll come back at 1020 and work on the network. So I guess there's no other questions. Then we will resume. <laughs> 10.20, no, Josh? Yeah, 10.20, we'll come back. And actually, and so, yeah, like I said, we'll, at that point, we'll just work for about a half hour. People can work on their own or work with other people in the course if you're in contact with them. And uh, But we'll be here in case there are any questions, so you can ask questions whenever, you're, whenever you want. And then after about a half hour or so, we can talk about uh, what we came up with. Or if people want more time, then we can, we can work for some more time. But, okay. Uh, there we go. Can everyone see the, the the notebook again? Now we see it. Okay, great. So, okay, let's go back. So, let's go back to the network. So here we started to make our our convolutional network class, and so let's do an init function. And let's make a, we're going to call this super function, which calls the, the initializer of the super class with the name of the, the current class. So that, that we don't need to worry about so much. But OK, so let's make a convolutional layer. And actually, before we even do that, let's look at the input. Let's make a code cell. OK. So we got that we we got all of the the values in this data set. And so this was actually our practice data set, which only had 10 events. But let's look at in any time using uh, using Python, do we have a, I don't know I, saw, I see a notification on the uh, on the teams. I guess thought maybe there was a question. Okay. No. So anytime we're using Python, if, if anytime, well, at least anytime I'm confused about a specific data structure or anything, I just type it in, data set, and it usually gives some sort of invasion. Okay, this isn't that useful. This is a next data set object. Let's look at the first event. Okay, so it's a big tensor. Let's look at the shape. doesn't have a shape because it's a tuple. Let's make it an umpire array and ask for the shape. Okay, that doesn't work either. So this is this is me trying to explore some object I'm not or that that uh, I'm not quite understanding. So we get item zero. Okay, event is toward the tensor. So it's a tensor. Um, so we can look up, I think maybe it's size. For some reason, so, hmm. 
Just maybe you are getting the label too. Ah, right. Okay, so that's right. Okay, thanks, Gonzalo. So, right, now we're getting the tensor. Now let's look at shape. Okay, so it's 20 by 20 by 60. Uh, so, and, and actually when we go to get a batch, we don't have a data loader set up, but we do have one down here. Let's uh, now a much larger data set. So, uh, so what's happening in the, the training is we're going through and uh, getting batches um, using an enumerate of the train loader. So the enumerate returns basically the function next. Well, actually, I thought it did. Huh. Okay, I'm trying to, I'm basically trying to show, I oh, know it's next train loader. I thought it was an iterator. Hmm. Okay. So this is my this was my failed attempt to uh, to to look in detail at these these objects. But basically, we're going to when we actually do the training, we're going to have a batch dimension uh, here. And so if we want to transpose to get the, the Z dimension and, and as the channel dimension, then um, we can use the transpose method of the tensor and transpose dimension zero and two. And now if we look at the size of that, uh, the shape, then it should be 60 by 20 by 20. So now we have Z, um, Y, X. And so actually we might want to transpose it again, the one and two dimensions. So now we have Z, X, Y. And so this is something that we might want to do in creating the, uh, the network. So I'd have to, we'll have to go back and look at exactly how these, these data loaders I thought that they they were iterators, so you call the next function and you get um, you get the next uh, element, the next batch, basically. Um, but apparently not. Josh, so, you, Josh you have yeah. to make iterator. So if you type uh, that iterator is iter of train loader, then it will work. Like this. No, but next, next, next is then outside. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this gives us a batch of the uh, the events and then the labels. Um, so like this. Well, I've already I've essentially already shown what I want to show. Um, and so since there's another code. So let's look at data.shape. Okay, so here we go. This is what I was trying to get to. We now have the uh, the batch X, Y, Z. And what we want to do is transpose that. Um, we want the one that's the channel dimension, or, or sorry, that's the, the X dimension here. Z, because we want the Z dimension to be here. Then we will want to transpose two and three to get X, Y. So, okay, so now we have batch channels X, Y. So now we can start using this as an input to a convolutional layer with um, the Z dimension being the channels and the X, Y being the next two dimensions. So let's do that as the first thing in our network. 
Um, so in the forward function, x is the is the value that comes uh, through as the input, and we're going to do those two transposes. So now we have x as as this kind of a tensor, batch channel x y. So now let's make one convolutional layer, and then uh, we'll work kind of on our own for maybe 20 or 30 minutes and try to construct the rest of the net. So um, let's call it comb one. And uh, so we'll take, we'll make a comb 2D layer. So it takes channels. So we're going to put 60. Now we want the output no number of channels. So let's let's increase that to 128. So we're going to have several different kernels, several different weight matrices. And we want to make them, let's make them three by three. So we looked at two by two in the slides. We'll make them three by three. And let's keep stride at one and padding also at, at zero for the moment. So that's our first convolution. And so um, now let's run through that. So we're going to take the, the input x transpose to get the, the dimensions right and then run through the convolution. Um, and, and actually let's apply a ReLU activation. Okay. So in, in, with this we we're performing one convolution and then let's Let's from there just uh, go back to our previous strategy. Let's just flatten, and then um, let's see here. We're going to want to know what the dimension is of that. Let's keep the fully connected here with one neuron. Let's just keep it with one neuron. We want to know what our input dimension is, so we're going to need to figure out um, what is the dimension of the tensor x at this point. So I told you that uh, when you are doing the, the linear uh, layer, you have 32 inputs. That, that is why. Uh, wait. So this that we we don't have 32. We're gonna figure out how many we need to have. Um, let's make this and uh, let's run. Also, actually, let's use it. I don't know what the best way to do this would be. What I would normally do at this point is just call the model and see. Um, CNN two D and and see what the dimensions are. Actually, no. You can we can make we could use this summary. Possibly. Let's keep it at 32 for now, but that's not going to be the right answer. We could possibly even try to calculate it, but let's see. Um, okay. So output shape is 128 by 18 by 18 because we didn't do any padding. So let's let's calculate that. That's going to be our number. When, once we flatten, we're going to have this number. So that's going to be our number of uh, inputs for our linear layer. Um, let's do a sigmoid. Oh, first let's apply the, the, the linear layer. Um, X, and then let's do a sigmoid. And then return X. See that actually, I didn't like that. No, I have to SC one. Oh, it should be self.
Okay. So now we've gotten it down again to one neuron. We've done one convolution and uh, produced 128 output channels. And now we're, we're feeding all of that, we're flattening that and feeding it all into one neuron. So that's, that's kind of like our example network, but we've, we've, instead of using a linear layer first, this one, we're using a convolutional layer. Uh, okay, so we have one neuron. And that is going to be our, our output neuron. I believe this. So let's try to train with that. Everything else should be the same. We may want to change the learning rate, but let's keep it the way it is for now. And let's use the 2D CNN. Here goes. Not sure if it will actually get any better. It looks like it's, it's not really doing anything. You might need to decrease the learning rate, but this is, so basically what I wanted to show is how to get started on this. And so this, that's how to get started on this. Um, that wasn't fully prepared in advance, obviously. That's why we had some, uh, some, some issues. Uh, so let's, let's change the learning rate. So at this point, I would say that, um, let's see. Okay. So here we go. Now it looks like it's actually training. So basically I, I decreased the learning rate, which corresponds to the small displacement that you're making in the gradient descent. Um, so that often makes the training take uh, or go a bit slower, but you often need to decrease the learning rate in order to get it to train at all. Uh, and so in this case, it might it may not even be, this is also not the ideal setup um, because we have one, we just have one convolution. We're not doing any kind of pooling or anything and we're sending it all into a, a, a single, um, a, a fully connected layer. So actually, it doesn't. I don't see this doing too much. But at this point, at this point, let's try to work on a network that improves this. So perhaps does more convolutions and does some pooling. Um, and hopefully, arriving at a result of okay. So here we go. Something's happening here. Um, arriving at a result that is better than the previous result. So maybe let's take 20 or 30 minutes to, to work on that. Um, mainly focusing on, again, on this part, the network. And after that, we'll, we'll continue with this particular solution and make the full convolutional network um, with several layers and with pooling. So I don't know if that is, does everyone think now is a good time to to do that. So does, does everyone think they have uh, an idea of how to proceed from here? Okay, well. I think we can try yours and then you are going to give us the solution later, no? Well, yeah, a, a solution. Uh, so basically a continuation of what we just started here. Um, it's not necessarily the best solution, but it's a, it's a potential solution. Um, and so I'll go through that, but I was, I wanted to take maybe 20 or 30 minutes for people to try things on their own. As I mean, yeah. as we just saw, it can be kind of confusing. Um, but yeah, I right. we try, try by ourselves and then you try maybe to give us your solution. Yeah. Okay. So Sorry, maybe, yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess you have to take out the last sigmoid because you are using binary percent. You're right. Maybe that's why we're not training very well. Okay, good catch. Right. So, um, all right. So let's do that. And uh, we'll get started again. But either way, the point is now to continue this. Uh, try to try to improve on this uh, on this network. So I'm going to leave it. I'll leave. 
So we can work, let's say, let's say 20 minutes and, and maybe, maybe some more time if we need, we'll come back in, in 20 minutes, but uh, I'll stay here in the meantime. If anyone has any questions, uh, then we can try to, to go through them.
All right, so I don't know if any, anyone's made any progress or has any questions or if, if, if uh, maybe we should go through the rest of the, the convolutional net solution. Um, there's any opinions on, do we want more time? Maybe we need a little bit more time. I don't know. I will give us something like 10 or 15 minutes more time, Josh, but whatever you think. Okay, well, let's, okay, so let's say till 11.15 and then we'll, we'll come back and see where everyone's at. Um, but, but remember, um, I mean, we're here if there's any questions right now or in the next 15 minutes.
Okay, so how's everything going? Um, are there any questions at this point or do we want to go through, uh, continue going through a convolutional network here? I was still working, Josh, but maybe it's time to go and show the, the sample. I don't know what other people think. So I don't know, is anyone else, has anyone else made any progress or um, wants to share what they did or uh, wants to see um, a continuation of the solution? Okay. Here we go go ahead and, and try to show the solution, you know. Okay. At least get, guide us in the right direction. Okay, so one one possible thing that, that can be done here is, uh, okay, so uh, let's, let's create a couple more convolutional layers. One common way of approaching these components is, uh, is, is to, reduce in the uh, in the dimension of the of the original input or the, so in this case reduce in the XY dimension and increase in the channel dimension. So that's the strategy we're gonna follow here and so we're gonna create a couple more convolutional layers. Uh, so for example this one which is going to take the 128 channels of the previous layer and make more channels. Um, and so we're going to do two by two because at this point we're going to have reduced the uh, the x in in the x y dimension. So actually, be before doing that, we probably should have defined a pooling layer. In this case, it doesn't matter what what order we define everything in; it matters what order we apply them in in the forward in calling the forward function. But um, Let's let's define them in the order that that we intend to apply them. So okay, so we're going to do a max pooling. Remember that's going to select in um, the the area of the kernel size. That's going to select a maximum uh, value and just use that as the output. So we're going to do a kernel size of three because we we did three by three convolutions. Although. It doesn't necessarily need to match the kernel size of the, the previous convolution layer. And we're going to do a stride of three. So that's going to reduce our, our dimensions by a factor of three. And so we started with, um, uh, so we're going to have 18. We saw here that we had an 18 by 18 um, XY dimension after the convolution. And we're going to reduce that by a factor of three. So we'll be at six by six. Uh, so we're reducing in the XY dimension and we're increasing in the number of channels later. So we've already increased to 128 channels. We're going to do the pooling and then we're going to increase again to 256 channels. Um, and so then we're going to do another pooling. And this time we're going to do a stride of two. Uh, now let's let's do another convolution. So now with the stride of uh, three, now we're down to so we're down to six. Stride of two, we're down to three. Um, it also depends on if we don't use any padding in this the second convolution, we'll probably be down to five by five, and then the the, the pooling of two will bring us down to um, probably either two by two or three by three. Um, let's see when we do the it, it so. Sometimes these these uh, these dimensions are somewhat confusing. It depends on um, it, it may also depend on the actual implementation of of the of the convolution and pooling layers as to, for example, if you have a five by five and you're going to do a stride of two with a two by two, um, sometimes it's it's hard to know exactly what dimension that will leave you with. And so we can look in the summary. Um, and if we need to, we can add print statements to uh, to 
see what our dimensions are at different steps of the, the network. So um, let's see, com 2D. So we're going to do 256 channels, and we're going to make that into 512. And we'll do uh, two two by two convolution since we're down to very few um, inputs in the X, Y dimensions. And we're going to do one more pooling to get us down to a one by one, um, a one by one X, Y dimension. And but we so now we've we've made up for that re reduction dimension by increasing the number of channels. So let's see. Max pool, another two by two with stride of two. Okay, so now our uh, our first fully connected layer, if we assume that we've got a one by one dimension in X, Y, we're only gonna, when we flatten, when we flatten that result, we're only going to have the channels, basically 512. So we're gonna use that as the input for our linear layer, and then we can make what the, the final linear layer. Um, so actually, let's make it a 128 neuron. We're going to have two linear layers at the end of the network. We don't necessarily have to, but um, we can. It, it may help to have another linear layer before we actually make the classification. And let's do a dropout layer that we're going to apply on that the second last linear layer. So this is this was just um, to to know how to, to do this stuff. It's basically it often comes with trial and error and just um, experience of having done these kinds of nets before. Where you, th this is not necessarily the answer. You could do other things. You could put the dropout on different layer. You you could put multiple uh, dropout layers. You could it, remove the dropout completely. Um, you could use one linear layer. We could add. Uh, we could add another one here. We could say. Um, we could make a one. So one twenty eight input. We could reduce to now thirty two. So basically, now we're looking at the rest of the network. Looks like our first. Um, our first network. We could do that. Let's just leave two linear layers actually for for now, because uh, I've already tested this with with uh, this particular configuration and, and I'm not sure what uh, what adding the additional linear layer would do probably wouldn't make that much of a difference. Um, but OK, so we we've done our transposes. So now we're, we're going to actually take these layers and apply them. So. Um, Sorry, Josh, yeah. could you could you go through the dimension in every of the steps? You know, for example, in the first one, you had 60 channels input and 128 output, yeah. but then in can you go through all how the dimension goes? I, I was a little bit lost. OK, yeah, let's do that here. Actually, let's do that with this uh, with this the net summary. So uh, right now we're let's try to set up the net and then look at the dimensions. So um, here. So first of all, we're going to. Let's let's apply each of these layers one by one. We're going to do the the first convolution. We already did that before. So, OK. One second. OK. Uh, OK, so we're applying the first convolution. And then we're going to apply the, the first pooling. All right, so now let's do, actually, maybe we can look, I wonder if we can look at the network now. OK, Dropbox. <laughs> no one saw that. Drop out. OK. So all of this using Dropbox for these for these uh, files that I, I type Dropbox instead of drop out. OK, so um, here's so here's here's the dimension so far. We've we've done our first convolution 
and we've got 128 channels and 18 by 18. So remember, we started with 60 by 20 by 20. The first convolution, we ended up with 18 by 18 because we're not doing any padding. And it's just like we saw in the slides that because the, the convolution, if for example, in this case, it's three by three. So we're only going to be able to fit 18 of those in, in each dimension. OK, so then we did our max pooling and we're six by six as, as we, we expect. OK, so now let's um, let's do the next convolution. And we're going to use ReLU again as the as the activation. So that, now we just we're each time we're taking X and putting it as the input to the next layer. So let's try the, the pooling. All right. So now we're down to six by six and we did the uh, the next convolution that was two by two so we're five by five because we didn't pad the next pooling took us down to two by two so it took us down a factor of two and so we can't be in dimensions of 2.5 2.5 so it, it uh it took us down to two uh, let's see let's try the Let's try the final convolution. We'll use ReLU again. And now we'll do the final pooling. So actually, the, the final convolution, let's look at this. So the final convolution, it doesn't, it doesn't like for some reason. Let's see here. What do we do wrong? Um, in groups one, weight of size expected to have 128 channels, but got 66 channels instead. It may be that we can't fit the convolution. Right. So we're doing we're doing a two by two convolution, and we only had before a. Uh, a two by two. So let's try padding. But don't you have to use COM3 at that step? Have you oh, you're, right. Right. you're right. Maybe that's what we do. You're right. Sorry. Exactly. Let's try that. OK, thanks. OK, great. So now we're down to a one by one. Uh, and so Actually, we don't need to, we don't need the final pooling because the the com three uh, took us down to to a one by one. So we can stop there and go to start applying the linear layers. Um, so let's try. First of all, let's flat. Yeah, we flattened it. Let's try the linear layer. First one. Okay. And actually, let's apply also a random. So the activation of that layer is all we're also going to use random. Now let's try. You mean, you mean the self, Josh? Ah. Here. Yes. Thanks. It's hard to code under pressure here. Uh, so now let's apply the dropout to this this particular layer. And uh, now let's do the final layer. And we're not going to apply the activation. this is this is what Gonzalo was talking about before. We don't want to do the sigmoid because the loss is taking that into account already. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of little details to keep track of. So okay, let's see what this does. All right, so now we're we're down. We we did convolution and pooling all the way down to a one by one with five twelve channels. Then we uh, we flattened that. So basically, we had um, at that point. We had a minus, basically minus one. So all of the, the batch dimension, whatever that may be, 
by by 512 and then we took it down to 128 with our uh, linear layer and then we took it down to one we applied the dropout to this the the 128 neurons here okay so this network's much more complicated but it actually doesn't have that many more parameters than the fully connected network did mostly because of the the weight sharing in convolutional layers so uh, let's try to train with this network. So here, your philosophy, just is try to reduce the x y dimension and putting more output in the channels until you get more or less a flat neural network. No. Uh, until we get more or less. Sorry, I. So you are reducing the x y information and put it and putting them somehow in the channels, no, in the other dimension, until you end up more or less with a flat neural network, something like that, flat layer. Exactly, exactly. And then, so basically, when we call flatten, we're not really doing anything interesting. We're just removing these two dimensions here that are one anyway. So we're just telling it to to not keep track of two extra dimensions that are size that are of, of of size one. And so right, we've we've moved a lot of the information into the channel dimension. Um so what happened here? I thought that your session crashed after using all available RAM. Great. So this is the this is what I said might happen. Um Let's try again. Restart runtime. So basically, we just have to run up to that point again. And then we'll see how this, this network does, at least after 10 or so epochs. All right, so there's our practice data set. The network we're not going to use anymore. OK, here's the new net. All right. Again, okay, it, it's cutting it close. The RAM is almost full. Okay, so that was that was what we were doing earlier to to figure out how to transpose the dimensions. Okay. Oh, sorry, I had my microphone muted. So now, now it looks like it's getting somewhere. Accuracy is going up. We're already, I think we're actually already doing better than the, than the linear net. Okay, <laughs> just making sure that we change the model name so that we actually are using the common net. While it's doing that, let me see if it, I might want to train for 10 more epochs just to, just to get a bit better. And so, hmm.
in that case, we can load in. Yeah, let's let's load in the model. Once it's done training, and maybe we can train in for 10, 10 more epochs. Okay, well, let's. Thanks, Bryce. <laughs> so I was muted. So I was just, I just said a bunch of stuff and uh, no one heard it. So basically, so what we did here was we called a operating system, or sorry, a command line command. Uh, this is basically just like calling LS on the, the Unix or Linux command line. The exclamation point allows us to use these commands and it's listing the directory uh, models. And so we've got a, um, We've got our models that we've trained. We're going to pick the latest one and we're going to use that here. We're going to load model true. So it's going to start from this model and continue training. Training equals true for 10 more epochs. So let's do that. So let's see if we can get a little better. Unfortunately, it's not going to show us from the from the very beginning. Well, let's see. We're our, we're we're here already over sixty percent accuracy. And it looks like it's still improving, so that's good. Wow, it looks like it's actually taken a taken a spike. It's going up even even faster. So it's it's catching on to something. Maybe we should have trained twenty more epochs, but we can always train an additional ten. But I think the idea is more or less clear. Um, I hope this has all been useful. Uh, so again, all all of the we'll let it keep training here. All of the links to the slides to this code. Some more background information are all available on the, the Indico. So, um, and actually, after this, I can try to update the uh, the notebook on basically on in this link. 
with this version that we uh, that we came up with here. So that you'll have that. Okay. So uh, I think we already did that. So let's run the model. Let's see what this looks like now. Okay. So so we're starting to to separate the two even more. There's a lot of background that the model is now much more certain of. This is closer to to zero in in the prediction. So let's take a look at the signal versus background curve. Okay, it's it's looking better. It's getting closer to the this upper right hand corner, although it's not anywhere near there yet. Um, so training this for some more time will probably do will probably create even more separation between signal and background. Um, looks like it's still going up, so we could train even further. Um, but I think maybe this might be a good place to stop unless unless anyone has further questions. Again, I hope this has been useful. Hi, yes. Uh, could you please go back to the design of the model and maybe give us a taste of what led you to, what intuition did you have to come up with the strategy of converting the convolutional neural network in the one dimensional one. I mean, just to think, <laughs> to, to, to understand how you are thinking in this particular problem. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So this is just because um, this is a strategy I've seen before and we've worked with before. And so that was the first thing that came to mind. We want to make a relatively simple. Well, not necessarily simple, but a um, basically a straightforward convolutional network. This is uh, a, I, I, I suppose, commonly used strategy. So, really, the only kind of insight I would say that 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 one actually has in this situation is knowing that okay, we should reduce the dimensionality in x, y, and increase the number of channels. Everything else were just numbers that that I, I more or less picked, not necessarily at random, but just reasonable numbers. So 128, that's that's a good number of channels. We can make a somewhat smaller net just by reducing the number of channels. So we could actually, the reason that I started with 128 is because we already started with 60. Um, if we were doing 3D convolutions, we would actually have one channel and the input would be 20 by 20 by 60. And so at that point, we might want to increase to 16 channels or 32 or some smaller number. But since we were already at 60 channels, I didn't want to drop the channel number here. So I chose 128. People commonly choose multiples of two because that's that. Um, I guess that makes it easier to uh, to divide. Uh, for example, the the, in, the input size is often also a, a multiple of two. That way, when you do strides of two in your pooling, for example, you reduce by factors of two, and you don't get situations like the one we ended up in, where you have something like five by five, and then you do a two by two stride, and you have to, uh, at some points, either some value gets maybe not ignored, but the dimensional reduction is not as clear because you're not looking at evenly divisible numbers. So. The reason I picked powers of two was basically just because that's that's a common thing to do. Um, started with 128, went up to 512 because three convolutions was more or less enough, or three three convolutions plus pooling was enough to bring us down to one by one. And so that's why I stopped there. Um, basically, uh, yeah, the only insight kind of is okay. I want to take the x y dimensions down to one by one and. I want to increase my channel dimension. And so the rest of the numbers were chosen more or less randomly, not not, not completely randomly, but um, randomly within within reason. Uh, and then the linear layer just picked a number. We don't need again, we don't need to have two of those. Um, we could just try with one. Uh, we could also put more, but at some point uh, it may not it, it may not help so much. Um, somehow, so, yeah. sorry, just somehow the question I think was from Adrian. I think it's very important. It's like, what are the guidelines? You know, how to uh, create your convolutional neural network, or how to improve it? No, because now you have a, yeah. a, a neural network that works that works better than before. But 
how to yeah. optimize it, you know, how how you will go further. <clears throat> okay. So in this case, uh, first the first thing I would do is just train until uh, until I see this the accuracy stabilize more or less till I get uh, the the maximum accuracy. Then uh, I would if I wanted a better net. Um, first of all, if it looks like we're overtraining a lot, that would probably be the first problem to to handle. So um, maybe increasing my my dropout. Uh, probability, um, 0.8, uh, the, or maybe adding some regularization, which is something that we didn't really talk about today, but I believe I believe we looked at last week. And actually, I don't have in my head right now how to, how I would do that. I would have to to look it up. Um, and so, if uh, another thing is if you're just not getting if if your your validation loss seems to more or less match your training loss, which is kind of the case here at the end, they're starting to diverge a bit, but more or less it's matching. Uh, you can consider making a bigger net because it, it just may be that your net is not large enough to, to account for all the possibilities, or at least the way it's being trained, it's not accounting for all of the possible, uh, the possibilities that it could in and in, in, in not extracting all of the information that it could from your data, so you can make a bigger net. Uh, you could so th there are other strategies people have used. I guess so. Let's see. Uh, this is let's see. I'm going deeper convolutions. This is a network developed by Google. Let's see here. So. They're using these these modules that contain several different types of convolutions in them, and so this this at, at, at this point you have to be careful as to what all of the dimensions of your tensors are, um, and when when they do this concatenation step, they're so they, they're getting feature maps of a certain size and they're putting them together in the channel dimension. Um, in the end, this network. Um, this network ends up being huge. So here we go. Like, let me see if I can zoom in on this. If you look at the entire network, they're doing a lot of stuff here. So this is much larger and much more complex. Uh, I believe they're also looking at the output at different stages. Uh, one particular trick that's been used, that's now being used very commonly, is to skip to add skip connections. So basically, um, your, I don't, know, uh, I don't know how to explain this in a very easy way because I don't have a diagram, but uh, basically your, if you're performing some, some convolutions, you're also passing the original information uh, to the to the other side of your your block of convolutions and including that in for example another channel. So I don't know. It's it's hard it's hard to explain intuitively what to do because I, I would argue that no one knows for sure in a for in a specific problem. The, the normal normally the way these are approached are is you have a you have a data set you want to you want to train a network to do a specific task. And you start with something like, for example, this. We have we we have our our two D net, and then and then you go from there and you try different things. It's not always the same procedure. There's not necessarily a recipe, but there are several tricks, and one of them is the one that we used, basically reducing the dimensionality in x y into the channel dimension. Then you're left with some basically flat layer, and then you you do some some linear layers with with some dropout. That's one potential strategy. So there are kind of guidelines, but there's no real recipe. Really, what what I would do is start looking around at other what other people have done, um, in in your specific problem, if if other people have worked on it, and also in related problems. So image recognition is a related problem to this because they're classifying images based on some some input two D matrix, the image itself, and sometimes it's actually got three channels because it's red, green, blue. It's got three uh, color channels, 
So basically we just took 60 channels um, for this particular data set and, um, and used this approach. Uh, I don't know how to, to better explain that. And maybe if, I don't know, Maria, do you have any other suggestions? Uh, right, so um, I mean, the first thing is that this, this networks have a really a lot of parameters. So uh, if you have a problem and then you say, I'm going to start with the fully co connected uh, network, it doesn't mean that this is a simpler one. It can have much more parameters. So you probably want to like, you know, when you get the problem, you want to see what kind of uh, uh, layers make sense in this case, it is uh, convolutional layers. Um, and then what you want to do is um, you want to take a, a small sample of, uh, of your data set and be sure that you can overtrain the network, which means that uh, your network has enough capabilities of actually just remembering the data set. Because if you can't even do that, then this is your first problem. So you have to figure out why. So maybe you start training and the loss doesn't go down. So it means that either your network is, uh, is extremely small. So if I have two parameters and uh, you know 100 images of uh, 30 times 30, then of course I can't train that. But uh, also it can be that your learning rate is too high, so then it doesn't uh, it, it it doesn't fit well for your network, or it can be that um, you are uh, regularizing too much, so you have to remove all the regularizations, all the dropout, all the uh, L1, L2 norms that you might introduce to your weights, and um, uh, and also it can be that your weights are wrongly initialized. I don't know if you remember from the last week of Adri's talk that it can happen that. Uh, uh, if, if you don't initialize well, well the weights, uh, the gradients are, are vanishing, so you're not training at all. So these are all little stuff that you first make uh, need to make sure on a very small set of your data that you can actually overtrain it. So once you're happy with that, you you see that you overtrain the data set, you can fix the uh, like more or less have an intuition of what your learning rate should be. Probably want to lower it slightly a bit when you start training then you, you start training and see. So if you start overfitting fastly, then it means that you're, uh, you need more regularization and, and then you play. So once you get some basic set that it gives kind of okay result, then you can start playing with the more complex models, but you know, start simple and understand what is actually happening with, uh, with your training, with the gradients and weights and all this stuff. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. That's, uh, in fact, um, that reminds me of several things. Basically, in, in coming up with this, this solution, it's not the kind of final solution. I've done a whole lot of, op I haven't done really any optimization, but I ran into several of those problems. In fact, I started with a smaller data set. I started by looking at 5,000 events. Uh, I started by, you know, trying trying to construct the net and while having the problems that we had earlier where the dimensions weren't working out, okay, I had to figure out what all of my dimensions were at different points. And then, okay, finally I got one that made sense. You can see in the summary, we get down back, we get down to one neuron. Okay, then we go to train it and it's not training. Well, why isn't it training? Who knows? There's several, there's several things. Well, it actually in the, in that, the case, in this particular case, I had the learning rate at 10 to the minus two, which is kind of relatively large for these sorts of problems, depending on your network. But I would say it, for the fully connected network, it, it more or less worked. For the convolutional network, it didn't. It wasn't training. So I actually just, I had to lower it. I ended up lowering it to 10 to the minus four, and then it actually started to train. So there, there is some trial and error in this. And, and like Mario was talking about, it's important to, to adjust your learning rate and also the initialization of your weights. And uh, also things like, for example, this, <laughs> this is something that in, in the past, uh, when I, when I, whenever I've told Maria, well, my network's not training, the one, the first question she asks is, did you shuffle your data set? And so this, this is important also, if you, if you don't do this, it may not train. And that may actually be the reason that, uh, especially if you're taking a certain part of your data set and you say say you've got it organized into half signal and then half background and you don't shuffle it at all and you're taking all of your your validation as background you start to get kind of uh, nonsense results or you start to get okay it's always 
you know, the, the validation accuracy is always uh, very low or very high, like things seem to be very one sided, then it's because of things like that. So there's there's a lot of little details um, that you have to to think about. But uh, yeah, as Mario said, it's best to start small. And um, and once once you have something that makes sense, then start optimizing. Sans, Josh, and Maria, I still want the one question, which is related with the with the Google Net that you put there. So, in your example, Josh, somehow the neural net is sequential, is in series. No, the output of one layer goes to the next one. No, it seems that there could be also the possibility that from the same you have an input and you can put different layers that applies to, to the same input, then you have a collection of outputs that you can put now to the next level of neural networks. Is that right? That's what somehow this thing is doing there, no? So this is a different strategy, no? The strategy that you have followed is just linear. The output from one layer go to the next one, while you can try it a different strategy, no, that is in kind of parallel from one input, you have different layers, no, and then you can combine them, no, is that correct? Uh, right, so, so, um, you, uh, so, yeah, you can, okay, go ahead. Uh, like the idea behind Google Net is that if you notice that when we uh, set this linear network, you always fix the size of your kernel. Uh, and the, the idea behind Google is that uh, you don't have to fix it to three times three. So you see that the convolution here are three times three, then five times five. So you kind of like pick up features that are, um, uh, you know, on a different uh, radius. Size, from your, so something like that, no? But of course, the Google Net is one example. Um, then the, there is this ResNet that it actually gives better results than Google Net. So, um, I mean, I, I don't know, I guess you just have to like keep track of different architectures. But notice that um, if you do something like that, maybe your accuracy increases a couple of percent, but it's not like uh, 30%, you know? So you should try to get a reasonable good result with the kind of like a simplish models and then try to get your know, couple more percent by doing this kind of stuff. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much for your answers. I think I got it more clear now. Thank you. All right, thanks. Okay, so I guess if there's, uh, if there's no further questions, then um, I guess what, what I could do is upload a version of this notebook on the, the GitHub that, that has the, the 2D continent. And uh, so that way it's available. And I guess we can stop here then. Okay, yes, please, Josh. Make the, the solution available to everyone that we can look at it. And if there is no comments or there is no other questions, then we resume again tomorrow at nine with a session dedicated to LACB and also some nuclear physics. All right, thanks everyone. Okay, we will meet again in the interactive classes. Okay, we have the live event, but we will meet in these classes that everyone can talk and interact, okay? Okay, thank you very much, Josh, Maria, and the rest of the Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye.